before we start, um, as, as Philip introduced me, I'm also an investor, right? I invest in, in, in startups at this stage. But um, the guys I have on stage, well, they're important guys. They can invest in one company more money than I manage in LaunchHub, right? So uh, pay attention to them. But let me start by, because the, the panel, the topic of the panel today is pitching and mistakes. So let me start by asking the guys to pitch for one minute what they do um, and to present themselves the funds and some of the investment they have made. So Terry, would you like to start? Hi, very happy to come there to be here in such a dynamic city, uh, which I've discovered for the first time. Um, basically, uh, I started my career as a founder. I started my company uh, a little bit more than 15 years ago, which was a digital agency, which I sold to publicists uh, a few years ago. Then I stayed in the group. Basically, my job then in the group was to buy other companies in other uh, part of the world. Uh, I was in Shanghai during three years. And then I joined ISAI. Uh, ISAI is a venture capital fund. We invest in seed and series A, mostly in France and in the US. So from a range from a few hundred thousand euros to five million euros, basically. Uh, we have a few investments now. We invest in SaaS software. We have companies like such as um, Logmatic, for example, or uh, Sticky Ads, which we sold uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, we invest also in Marketplace. So the most known we have is uh, Blablacar, and we have a large stake. Um, I'm Fredrik Nerander, Swedish, um, but I haven't really lived much in Sweden since the late 90s. Um, I have been uh, an investor professionally since late last year when I joined the uh, European Fund Late Start. Before that, I ran engineering at a startup in New York called Oscar. Um, healthcare startup uh, grew from about four people to 450 in two and a half years. Um, before that, I ran engineering at Tumblr. Um, joined that team also when it was less than 20 people and um, left when we sold it to Yahoo. Um, before that, I've uh, worked and lived in many places around the world, uh, Tokyo, Hong Kong, London, Helsinki, Munich. Uh, actually worked with Frank for a brief stint in Hong Kong uh, 10 years ago or so. Um, my background is building, building products, uh, not sort of vertically specialized in any specific field, and uh, I'm usually the tech guy on the team. Now to fund, I'm, I'm the tech guy in the fund, so I spend my time mostly looking at the more technical companies, uh, doing the technical part of due diligence, and then also assisting founders and teams uh, in our portfolio companies. Um, some of the more notable investments we have is uh, Spotify, Airbnb, um, we invested in SoFi, a finance company on the West Coast. Uh, my last company, Oscar, we're the only European fund invested. And, um, we invest anywhere between two to maybe 25 million dollars each round. We currently have about half a, half a billion euro under management. That's it. Lake Star is the name of the fund. If you need any money, drop by and you know, pitch me. Uh, hey everybody, uh, my name is Karel, Karel Babuk, uh, Czech. Uh, I uh, also have technology background, uh, computer science, database systems, then IT security. I uh, have to build a company called ABG Technologies uh, that made it to, to New York Stock Exchange, uh, returning investors over 150 times uh, on the investment. Uh, then I did a few angel investments, primarily in technology, not only. Uh, and now we're, um, together with uh, three other partners, we're uh, in a building a fund uh, called Evolution Equity. And we focus on IT security enterprise systems, mostly in the US, Europe, Israel included. Uh, IT security, I'm similarly, I'm uh, the, the geek in the, in the team, <laughs> the technology guy, um, and uh, we invest normally in the growth stage, so B plus, A plus, depending on where you are in the US, it's probably A plus round, anything between 2 to 10, 15 million, uh, so that's me. Great, so uh, Frank, um, I'm originally from Australia, started 
my first job as a, as a coder in Sweden, um, and then ended up doing lots of different things. Worked, as I said, together on a very crazy, massive engineering project once upon a time. Um, and uh, uh, then uh, I was at um, Horizons uh, Ventures, so I was on the boards of um, Siri, uh, before we sold to Apple, Spotify. Uh, we went in when it was just in Sweden. Uh, Sumly uh, led our investment into DeepMind, so did a lot of AI. Um, and then um, uh, started with some other partners, what is now Asia's biggest accelerator, which is based in Korea, called Spark Labs. And then we have our own fund called Spark Labs Global Ventures, which is like a, a founder collective, invests seed stage around the world, about 58 companies. Another 66 have gone through the accelerator. And then we have Spark Labs Capital, which um, just invested in Lyft's last round, so I guess we still believe in unicorns. Um, uh, certainly good ones like that. And then um, uh, we, I have a, a fantastic company, uh, which is a fast-growing micro-learning company called Smarter. And we have our tech here in Cluj. Uh, I love this city. I think it's the, one of the coolest startup hub, uh, hubs on the planet. We've just uh, we've got a, a big office, uh, which we've just opened up. And we need to fill it. <laughs> so uh, we're, uh, we're growing uh, fast here as we can. Okay, thank you. Um, Frank, I'll start with you because you've been in Accelerator, you have micro lending, you have done venture capital, but guys, please fill in. What are the criteria? What are the criteria when you evaluate investments? Are um, there a different, different stages? Yeah, it depends on the stage, right? So when it goes later stage, you're really, really looking at numbers. Um, at an early stage, you're looking at team and opportunity and the ability for the team to pivot um, or move as according to, you know, so, you know, whatever you're pitched at the start is probably not going to be what it is at the end. So you've got to gauge the team's ability and the team, and ultimately just the team's ability to hustle no matter what to get, to get it done. Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, that's the first thing you look at, you know, their hustle ability. Guys, anything you would like to add to that? Or, okay, so the team is the most important element. Carol, it's when you're listening to the pitch, <clears throat> and let's say there are 10 slides, um, objective numbers and so on, but since people are behind those, um, how important is the subjective element of your evaluation? Like, when you see them, um, what is the, <clears throat> the, the tipping point that engages you? Um, how do you judge the, the, the pitch on the soft skills of the founders? How important is it they, they pitch well, they sell? Uh, how important is they, they handle Q&A on the spot and so on? Okay, so uh, again, it depends on stage. Uh, the earlier the stage, the, the, the more soft skills prevail, or soft, soft skills, or, or just uh, the impact that the team has on me. Uh, it, it's not as much about presentation skills, even though it, it, it definitely counts, but uh, um, I, I totally understand that some people are, are scared of presenting, and, and, and they're, they're shy, and then present it to anybody. It's, it's, it's a lot at stake when they're presenting, when they're pitching to me about their business. So I can totally understand that they're uh, kind of uh, worried a little bit what, what, their, what their presentation looks like. But uh, at the same time, they will be put on the spot uh, from then on, on and on and on, all the time. So, so I, I appreciate if they can show, demonstrate this ability to persuade others to uh, their passion for the product um, and show that no matter what, they, they believe that they can build it. And they have a team that can support them. Okay, guys, so persuasion and ability to be um, passionate about what you're doing. I think these are soft elements in the skill. Uh, Terry, um, I was wondering, somehow, sometimes the founder oversell, or they tend to, sometimes. Sometimes they undersell, they're too shy. Do you think there is a borderline? Do you think there is a borderline when it's really too much oversell and it's becoming a lie? Yeah, yeah of, of course. There's two borderlines because don't oversell and don't undersell. Basically, as investors, we are looking for big ambition. Of course, we don't want a small company. We want you to be ambitious. We want you to make a unicorn, maybe ultimately. I mean, so don't undersell because if you just come and tell me we will do this, it will be small, but be confident, uh, it, it will not disappear. Okay, it will not disappear, but you make a small company, which I'm not interested in that. At the same time, if you oversell, I mean, you come and you say, I will do a new Facebook, it will be much better, and so on, 
Why not? But in this case, you just have to be very precise. What's the path? What's the way? How you will do that? Do you have the right team? Do you have a disruptive technology? I don't know. But so I would say, don't undersell. Don't oversell also. But sell, of course, sell. But sell with the right arguments. This was very well said, I think. Okay, so. Um, Frederick, you've been on the both sides of the table. You've been a startup founder, you've been also, you're now an investor, right? So, is the pitch very really important, looking from the perspective of the founder from the perspective of the investor? Does anyone put more importance than the other side? Um, I, I can't say it's, I think I would say it's equally important for both sides. I, said, I think the, the value of, of a good pitch is um, being able to explain to people what the problem is you're solving, I think is the and like framing the problem, this is a big problem we're solving, this is how we're going to solve it. You need to communicate that internally to all your employees all the time as well. You need to be able to communicate it to investors, to the media. So having a, having a strong pitch I think is extremely useful in, in so many ways. Mainly because you need to communicate. You're doing something innovative, you're doing something new. Hopefully it hasn't really been done the same way before and you need to explain to people why that is a good idea. Okay, so it's still important from both sides. Okay, Frank. Any interesting stories, awkward stories, about founders presenting pitching? Any pitches that went back in your career? Would you like to share some of those? Um, yeah, my own. No, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, no, I've seen, I've seen, seen quite a few. Um, I think one of the one of the ones that's the most frustrating one is when someone turns up and they've got a cool piece of kit, um, but they don't want to tell you anything because they're afraid you're going to steal it. And it's like, dude, if I had the time to go and steal this thing, like, really, I mean, I, I don't, and I'm not. Um, and that, that's, that's one of the things, you know, this, like, I'm going, I must protect my IP. You know, in the Valley, most people don't even care about patents most of the time, um, because by the time the patent's granted, you know, you will be either successful or not. you just got to move. So um, that, that one is... Uh, and the other classic mistake is trying to ask me to sign an MDA, which I will under no circumstances sign. Um, unless, of course, it's a very big round, which is, you know, needs the protection of an NDA, but otherwise, you know, those, those two classics always come up. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, what, what's your opinion on that? Do you sign the NDAs when you make this, when you listen to pitches? I try to avoid it. I mean, I try to avoid it because, as, as Frank said, uh, I don't have time to build it. I mean, this is, we're not stealing ideas. We're, I have quite a few companies in my portfolio. My, my fund has quite a few companies uh, in their portfolio. We have to build kind of Chinese walls between those companies and, and unless specifically told to, and there is a good reason. I mean, we, we, we definitely connect the people together or the companies together, but we do not share information or misuse it among those companies, we want all of these companies to succeed. So an idea that somebody comes in and, and we steal his or her idea and, and build something or hire people, and that's just ridiculous. By the time we, we do something like that, you better be off having a billion dollar company. So no NDAs because it's just, uh, yeah, it's money to lawyers that are unnecessary spent. Okay, <clears throat> uh, can you give us an example of uh, uh, actually the leads to understanding a bit more about the investment uh, decision making within the fund? So, is there a chance that you pass on a deal and then in the future you decide to invest on it? Or what happens after the pitch? Um, I think it, it, in many cases it begins before the pitch also. You meet, uh, you meet teams at accelerators, you know, different startup hubs, you randomly you get introduced by you know, mutual friends. Um, so usually, you, it's it's a it's a relationship over time. Um, in many cases, we do not invest the first time we hear the pitch. We follow it for for a fund. It's also like fund dynamics. Is the size of the investment right for the fund? It might be too early, but it, it might be a great business, and we follow and might invest at a later stage. I think um, for for a founder, I think it's better to keep good relationships with. Uh, potential investors then focus all your energy on a one-time pitch and then um, so th how we make investment decisions it's, it's different deal by deal um, 
I would say the, the big difference is, are we leading around or are we following someone else? That's, a, that's obviously a big difference. Uh, in our fund, we're, um, we have a pretty open uh, internal requirement to de you know, debate things. Everyone has opinions and uh, we can move fast if we have to. And, and um, I would say most funds don't move fast unless they really have to. This is one of, I would say, more, I guess more frustrating things for, for, a, for a founder that unless there's pressure to actually commit, you're not going to get much movement from the VC side. And um, we just, we just, the more data points you have over time, um, the better investment decision we can make. So it's not, a pitch is just one of those data points. Mm -hmm. But uh, guys, everybody can jump in on this. How many times do you, the, the, the entrepreneur should pitch before you make the decision? Is it just one pitch and then just follow on questions? Or is it more meetings? How does it go? Maybe it's not standard, just a typical example, let's say. First, we have quite a process because we are in seed, so very often we don't know the funder for a long time before. Right? It can, can happen, but in seed it happens we, we know the funder for just maybe a few weeks before we meet him. Uh, we are three partners, I should say. So basically one of us uh, meet on the team uh, one time, then we work on the basic basis on Excel documents, um, market research, etc., and then I will have to convince my two other partners. Uh, they may or not want to meet uh, the team. Usually, they, they will meet the team also. So it means two or three uh, meeting with the teams, and then we can go. I mean, basically, if the three partners are okay, we go. The process usually is one or two months. I think for us, again, it, it depends on the size of the investment, but if the company is already a bit major, later stage, I mean later, later than seed stage, if there is a team in place and then some processes and everything, we want to better understand how the company actually works, what's the, what's the internal climate in the company, so uh, pitch is one thing, but then meeting the company during due diligence, but also over a lunch or dinner or something, just just uh, watching the, uh, the, the, the communication style among the founders and trying to find out whether there are any issues, hidden agenda or something like that it is very important to us. So it, it's not just the pitch, it, it really is about the company, how it behaves and, and the founders, how they behave, how they respond and how they, how they also talk to or, or, or handle or uh, work with, with their team. So, uh, not just their peers, but their uh, their employees and others. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. So it's, it takes time, right? It's not one pitch and then a check. It takes several months usually, and it's more about interaction. It's more about how to work with the investors and your founder and what happens after the pitch. I think this is. A I'd say one other thing as well. Like um, I like um, founders that have researched why they want you. Um, so they've gone in and looked at you and your partner's background, they can articulate very clearly, I'd like you because, like, there's too many, you know, there's a lot of emails that turn up which are clearly, like, almost like mass mails out to every investor on the planet, um, you know, like, just changing the names, um, sometimes even mixing that up, um, but um, it's, uh, you know, it's like, dude, I think you mean Andreas, not us, but, um, but it's, um, yeah, I think the research, like, if you can articulate very clearly why you want this um, firm backing you, and then the other thing is articulate kind of like the roadmap. So the other tip is basically say, okay, if I'm going to do another funding, it's going to be here, and I'm going to be worth this much at the next funding round, and this is why, and this is what I need the money for. Like, frankly, those little basic tips, uh, you know, so few actually nail those ones. Okay, I would like to elaborate on that. Uh, when, you, when you say about this is the amount of money I want and for, for this time uh, and for these activities. So, are there things you really um, hate on feedbacks? Are there things that you think um, that you often see and uh, they're not correct? So, because one of my assumptions could be the amount that the premier small. I mean, is it, do they have a good assumption of the amount? Are there any mistakes that, that you see that are more typical? Uh, well, mistakes is a very rough word, but actually, are there any um, um, elements of the deck that, that are always on the discussion? 
that are not fixed for you? Uh, I think the most common um, missing um, thing in presentations is not actually explaining what problem you're solving. Mm -hmm. That's the most common thing I see. Um, so that's usually like, if the first question has to be, so what, it is, what is it you actually do? Or like, what is it you're actually trying to solve? Then you're missing a key point in your, in your pitch deck. Do you agree with that? Absolutely, absolutely. If, if the pitch is about technology, like, and I used this Ruby on Rails to build this new product, and I have to keep asking, who is the customer? What, what it is that you're solving? Then th this is something that cannot be easily, I mean, th th these pitches typically go, go away. I mean, you hinted things like valuation and expectations. These things could be solved. I mean, yes, there are people who have unrealistic expectations on valuation, etc. But this could be. I can I can imagine that people are not experienced and they they just read a few articles about Silicon Valley valuations and they they want the same. Um, and you can kind kind of explain in a discussion. But this this is probably the biggest failure. <laughs> All right, so guys, when you're teaching, spend enough time explaining the problem, not the technology behind. Spend enough time probably when, until the investors start doing this movement, all right? So this is the time when they understand there is a problem. All right, good. Um, any advice? Uh, okay, let's, let's go after uh, one element I, I would like to discuss with you. These are the, the questions you ask, right? So the, the, the question is present, then you, then you have Q&A. What are the typical uh, questions you, you go to after the pitch? Is there is something that is always missing? Or is there, uh, are there elements that you always would like to dig in? Or it's really case by case and there is no universal recipe for all questions that will come after the pitch? I would say it's quite case by case because it's very different. If they uh, technology, SaaS software, or in a marketplace where the marketing can be very important, but usually, I always want to know the ambition, where they want to go ultimately, which is linked to what we just said. I mean, what's the project ultimately, where you want to go. So that's something important. And once we have fixed that, which is very important, is how do you go there? Uh, you have the team, they have the technology, the right marketing skills, so, and then we have questions depending on the project. But basically it's the ultimate question, and then how you go there. I think that's that's a key thing, definitely. You can't if you only have the vision, you're gonna sound like out of touch with reality. If you only have the tactical plan, you're not gonna sound ambitious enough. So you need both the vision and the tactical plan together. I think that's that's key. And I, what the kind of companies I look for is, it should be a big honking problem they're trying to solve. So the vision should be big. There should be a, a clear technical solution for it. There should be a team that has deep understanding of the domain and also deep understanding of the technology they need to build to get there. Those things. And then, uh, as you said, both the tactical plan and the vision is, the, then, you have a, then you have a pretty good start. Okay, so one, one last thing. Um, are there industries or other elements in the presentation from the, what, what you hear that immediately means a pass for you, not you. Are there industries that you, when you hear a pitch in this industry, you're just, this is out of path. For sure, it's just overhyped, we don't go there. Or are there, uh, when you listen to, to, to the team presenting to you, can they do something, well, obviously lighter or something of this sort, sense that you would be just, no guys, I'll listen to you at the end, but it's clearly not. I think if it's too niche, I remember one, not so long ago, that started basically with like, I was presenting it, so windows. It was like, oh, interesting, you know, smart windows, heat, etc., and cleaning, and then on demand. And it turned out to be an on demand company to help manage cleaning of windows. And I was like, dude, that's really niche. Um, so, um, you know, if it's, if it's too small, I, I'm not interested. I, I, it's got to be something big. Um, uh, that's got a, a element to it, and especially now that investors are pulling back out of too many clones and copycats, and, and on demand is, you know, aside from Uber and Didi, is really shrinking. 
you know, look, all the stuff is really going, and obviously you've heard it before about AI, autonomous cars, um, you know, deep tech, biotech. Um, it, it's it's food. It, it's going right into deep tech again. And I think, especially here, there's so much physics, maths, computer science talent that doing another on-demand clone isn't interesting. Like, it's not taking advantage of all the talents here, all the data scientists that are here, right? You know, there's no reason for me why the next deep mind can't come out of Eastern Europe because the the tech talent is here. English is very good here, um, and it, you know, we, we'd be looking for something that's great. The other side is enterprise. Like, I think. Here, it's really, really strong from enterprise B2B play, um, same nature, because you can build something in an enterprise B2B play at, at very low cost here, frankly, to the US. Um, and enterprise really, if it's like, you know, if they compare two things to the side by side and one is a lot cheaper, they're going to go with that. And so that's a big opportunity for, for people here, I think. And it also how to pass, except too small. No, too, too small is definitely uh, one, one thing. thing. Another thing uh, for me very important is the personal fit, I would say. Because basically, it's like to marry someone. I mean, we will live together during five to ten years, especially we are coming in seed, so we will stay long term uh, in the company, and it's very difficult to divorce, right? So, the, the personal fit, can we work together? It's something very important. And that's a very human thing, so it means your pitch can may not work with a VC and work very well with another one uh, for this reason. So that's that's something important. Uh, apart from that, I would say also something uh, when you go see a VC, try to know which deal they did before, because each VC has its uh, focus. For example, at Isa, we focus on SaaS and marketplace. We don't do at all e-commerce because we think that at a point you will be in front of Amazon. Uh, we may be wrong, but if you do e-commerce, don't come to see us, go to another VC. Uh, it's very important because you lose time, we lose time also. Um, in, in some cases we pass because we're conflicted, because we made a previous investment in a, in a com compared to, to the startup, so in those cases we pass. I think it all goes back to the research, to your research. So your research in both in terms of the investor you're, you're pitching to, but also know your market. So if, if you're pitching to me about something new that nobody has done before and I'm invested in, in a similar company, then that probably is not very good as well. And, and yeah, the, the, the personal fit. I think Hussein had a great presentation yesterday explaining the, the background, mot or the motivations of VC and how VC internals work. And, and so understand the motives of the VC you're pitching to, uh, what their rational is, and they need something big as well in their segments. So that, that's critical, the research. Yeah. There, are also, there are also businesses that don't really fit, uh, are a good fit for venture capital, like consulting. Like, that's not necessarily something that scales in the way that venture capitalists want it to scale. So if I, if I may summarize, anything that is small, and I small means a few million dollar business is small for you guys, um, anything that is non-scalable, consulting, personal fit, and I think the best advice here was, guys, do your homework, do your research, see what kind. I think the three dollars investor has invested, and are they the right investor for you? Okay, the, the time is up, uh, so maybe just last um, question. Any particular advice uh, you can give uh, with regards to presenting to investors this topic? If I may, don't take it personal if you fail with one investor. Uh, if you believe that your product is good enough and, and your company, uh, try elsewhere. Don't take it personally. It could be the personal fit or something else. And also take the opportunity to get feedback from the investor after the pitch. Ask them like, what, why, why passing? You know, it's a it's a great place to get feedback. Agree with that. If you fail, just continue. Come back six months later. It can be a very different story. Yeah, I'll give a quick example, DeepMind. So this is a young team that basically had a hard time getting money out of the US because they were an AI team based in London. They were like, who's, wait, how could you do AI in London? And they thought like every AI scientist in the world is in the US. Um, and, uh, and they couldn't get money out of the UK, out of UK because most um, investors in the UK are bankers and so, um, you know, just didn't get AI if they like on demand marketplace. Um, but obviously they succeeded and you know, sold for a huge amount even before they launched to Google. So, you know, absolutely just 
drive through. You will find someone. Okay, guys. So this was it. I hope it was uh, interesting for you to listen to this advice. And uh, thank you, guys. Thank you for being here with, with me on the panel. Thank you for presenting what you do, and thank you for elaborating on pitch and what happened afterwards.